Welcome back to American Civil War Battles, Battles of the American Civil War, whatever you want to call it. And uh, before we start, I want to address why we didn't have an episode last week, because Dang over here deleted the episode that we had That's about not why. the, the uh, last episode we did, so That's we weren't able why. to get it out. So What about the week before that? <laughs> Dang, again, deleted an episode. and <laughs> Yeah, we missed a week. Next two weeks. And then uh, this week's episode, uh, I went to go edit, and the computer shut down. It's restarted out of nowhere and lost seven episodes that we recorded of various podcasts, including our last episode of uh, Civil War Battles, which was the Battle of Camp Cole, Matthias's Point, Battle of Hoax Run, Battle of Carthage, Battle of Rich Mountain, Battle of Quark's Ford, and the Battle of Blackborn- Blackburn's Ford. We did them all in one episode. <clears throat> Confederate... One Camp Cole, Matthias, Carthage, Blackburn, and uh, Union One, Corks Ford, Rich Mountain, and Hoax Run. But uh, most of them were just little skirmishes, anyways. Right. Nothing really important happened. That is the lead up to which we are doing right now: the Battle of Bur- Bull Bur Run, the Bull Run, the first, first, first major battle of the war, or Manassas, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so we're not going to recover those. Uh, no, all those other ones. We're going to skip straight into. <clears throat> bull if you guys run. want to just go back and read Wikipedia's things about them, and you'll be good. All right, and then um, yeah, Bull Run, Battle of Manassas, 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 Francis Manassas, <laughs> Rinky Dink Records. First Battle of Bull Run, which was the name used by Union forces, and uh, the Union for some reason liked to use river names as their uh, like nearby water sources as the names of the battles. Whereas Confederates you like to use nearby towns, which the nearest town of this battlefield was Manassas. Yes. It was the first major battle of the American Civil War. I mean, I guess you can count Sumter, but it wasn't really a. It was the one that started the war. But this is the first actual right. major A class battle fought on July twenty first, eighteen sixty one, in Prince William County, Virginia, just north of the city of Manassas, and only about thirty miles west southwest of Washington, dude. So this is like right there. The Union's forces were slow in positioning themselves, allowing Confederate reinforcements time to arrive by rail. Each side had about 18,000 poorly trained and poorly led troops in their first major battle, which ended up being a Confederate victory, followed by a disorganized retreat of the Union forces, which we've been seeing a lot of poorly trained, a lot of poorly led, and a lot of poorly disorganized retreats of both sides yep. uh, up till now. But, yeah, this I think this is the... They finally got a taste of a real big battle and neither side was prepared for it right and i think after this everybody on each side after bull run is like guess what guys we need to tighten our ship up well we're in a real war here (laughs) i thought this was just going to be a couple skirmishes and it'll be over shit's happening no yeah this is like uh britain and uh the colonies guys (laughs) could be uh the bloodiest battle more bloodier than the american revolution i wonder if it's more than the 1812 and revolution put together for sure, we already looked up the death tolls. Not for 1812. Yeah, we're all wars U.S. been in. 1812 wasn't really that many. No, it wasn't really. They just burnt down fucking, burnt down the White House. It wasn't really a war. Uh, we allowed a country to come in and burn our White House down. <laughs> what the hell? No choice. <laughs> it's stupid. Well, we're only 30 years old as a country. Well, got them out, though. We did. Surprisingly, twice, man. And then, can you believe it only took two times and then Britain was like, yeah, whatever. Whatever. Probably cost so much to send them over on ships and shit. Well, they all came down from Canada. Right, yeah. It's true. Just months after the start of the war at Fort Sumner, the northern public clamored for a much for a march against the Confederate capital of Richmond, mm-hmm. which was expected to bring an early end to the Confederacy. Mm-hmm. They're like, if we just take Richmond, guys. Well, I mean, let theor- every- yeah. theoretically, yes, right. but uh, a little harder than you think getting there. Right. Yielding political pressure, Brigade General Irvin McDowell led his unseasoned Union Army across Bull Run against the equally inexperienced Confederate Army of Brigade General P.G.T. Beauregard, camped near Manassas Junction. Oh, so they're marching down there. Both armies are both armies were sobered by the fierce fighting and the many casualties that realized and realized that the war was going to be much longer and bloodier than either had anticipated. Mm-hmm. The first battle of Bull Run highlighted many of the problems and deficiencies that were typical of the first year of war. Units were committed piecemeal 
attacks were frontal. Infantry failed to protect exposed artillery. Mm. Tactical intelligence was minimal, and neither commander was able to employ his whole force effectively. Dude, these guys just sent people, and they met each other 15 yards away in a star firing a weapon. Pretty much. McDowell had 35,000 men, could only commit about 18,000. And uh, Confederate forces had 32,000 men, could only commit about 18,000. So Mm. they couldn't even commit all their men. No. Because they were so poorly organized, they didn't know how to do it. Right. Damn, dude, look how... Beauregard was just a couple of minutes away from Washington, dude. That's it, dude. Dow's here. We got a couple others here, and they all converged, I'm guessing, right here, right? Yeah. Man. I'm surprised Washington didn't fall, dude, or even get really threatened. Not at all. We weren't trying for the capital, though. I don't think the South was. There's no way. I don't see why they wouldn't have been. I think they wanted to take out the shit in between and then make their way to the capital, which is kind of weird. When each cap each capital of the boards were <laughs> right now right there. Uh, 40, 50 miles apart from each other. Wow. It's crazy. And yeah, we only got to Richmond in the last year of the war, so that tells you how right. crazy they protected it. To just ah, <laughs> to suppress the Confederacy and restore federal law in the southern states, Abraham Lincoln called for seventy five thousand volunteers right. with ninety day enlistments. To augment the existing U.S. Army, about 15,000. Only had 15,000 men before that? That's, That's it. stupid. He later accepted an additional 40,000 volunteers with three-year enlistments and increased the strength of the U.S. Army to almost 200,000. Jeez. Nice. Lincoln's actions caused for more southern states, including four, Virginia. Four more. Yeah. Uh, four more. <laughs> <laughs> caused four more southern states, including Virginia, to succeed and join Jefferson Davis and his Confederate rebels. Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes, they're like, we're going to take our talents to South. Uh, ch- uh, t- can't even talk. <laughs> we're going to take our talents to South. <laughs> to the South. We're going to become rebels. We're going to n- win not one, but two, but three, but four, but five, but six of the first 15 battles. <laughs> <laughs> More than that. Okay. The Confederate capital had been moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Yes, sir. They're like, I don't like this capital being so far away. How about we just put it, How about right, we put it right by Washington? Jefferson Davis and Lincoln can look out their bedroom windows at each other. <laughs> <laughs> They're like flipping each other off. <laughs> in Washington, as thousands of volunteers rushed to defend the capital, General-in-Chief Lieutenant General Winfield Scott laid out a strategy to subdue the Confederate states. He proposed that an army of 80,000 men be organized to sail down the Mississippi and capture New Orleans. Mm -hmm. While the army strangled the Confederacy in the west, the U.S. Navy would blockade southern ports along the eastern and Gulf Coast, and the press press ridiculed what they dubbed as Scott's Anaconda plan. Instead, many believed that the capture of the Confederate capital of Richmond, only 100 miles south of Washington, would quickly end the war. It wouldn't. Which it might have. Maybe, but I think it's... Why not just fly to a flight, flee to another capital? Like, right. Right? I think. By July... Well, I don't know. Virginia was the most heavily... That's where all the military, the good military, oh, came from, yeah. Virginia. All right, and if you're going to succeed somewhere and have a capital, you need all your army there. Right. Well, but July, by July of 1861, thousands of volunteers were camped in and around Washington. Since General Scott was 75 years old and physically unable to lead this force, the administration searched for a more suitable field commander. And, Dude. Damn, look, I know. Look at this guy. Like, he's leading anything. Right. No, that plan is perfect, though. Go straight down the Mississippi and... and hold. Well, New Orleans was a major shipping right. shipping uh, port, well, so if they would have got that off. What he was also saying is once you go down Mississippi, you just take over spots here and there, so you the whole river is blockaded basically and then you get down to louisiana and then he said the whole east dude well that's what he's saying the army would take out the confederacy to the west and the navy right. would take all the ports right because along the eastern it. and gulf coast confederate navy was well, not that great even if there was one i bet you if they would have done that oh it would have been over. tried to take all the ports and the, um it'd been finished and attack them from the west as well dude they would probably have probably ended more and more yeah, earlier because instead they focused on richmond yep hmm. Secretary of Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, champion fellow Ohioan, 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 42-year-old Major Irvin McDowell. Mm -hmm. Although McDowell was a West Point graduate, his command experience was limited. In fact, he had spent most of his career engaged in various staff duties in the adjutant, adjutant general's office. While stationed in Washington, he had become acquainted with Chase, a former Ohio governor and senator. Now, through Chase's influence, McDowell was promoted three grades to brigadier general in the regular army. Oh, look at that. Like, how would you like to be a brigadier general? Sure! 
pay raise? Nah, a little <laughs> bit. A <laughs> really, mm -hmm. eh. couple mm -hmm. shillings. <laughs> right. But you're basically in the front line. Okay, generals, man, usually like to lead the lead the pack. But the smart ones stayed behind. They usually found themselves a hill or a high point that right. they could keep an eye on everything. Uh, on the 27th of May, was assigned command of the Department of Northeastern Virginia by President Abraham Lincoln, which included the military forces in and around Washington, the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Well, good for them. McDowell immediately began to organize what became known as the Army of Northeastern Virginia. <laughs> 35,000 men arranged in five divisions. Nice. Under public and political pressure to begin offensive operations, McDowell was given very little time to train the newly inducted troops. Of course. That's why they're idiots. Mm -hmm. Units were instructed in the maneuvering of regiments, but they received little or no training at the brigade or division level. So these guys don't know what the hell they're Nothing. doing. He was reassured by President Lincoln, who... Uh, Quote, unquote, says, you are green, it is true, but they are green also. You are all green alike. I mean, that's true. I can see he's like, so you guys all oh, suck, so uh, right. maybe you can be just a little less shittier than there's, the rest. There's two good scenes in a uh, couple good movies. Actually, most of the training scenes with um, Glory is just how uh, they're describing here. Illiter illiter illiterate, ignorant, no nobodies that don't know how to even march, right? And that is with the, what, the 54th. But that's about a black right. regiment. But still, uh, and Gettysburg, there's uh, about a 45-minute uh, to an hour-long segment. I think it's either Pickett or uh, oh, who was the other general? Anyway, another general in that movie where he had a bunch of misfits that he had tried to get ready. And, and he was like, we're going to get, they're marching this way. So we got, you know, like a week or so before we know we're going to be in battle. And these guys didn't know how to load their gun, take it apart or whatever. That might be a little falsifying of to hype it up for the movie. That was already two years into the war. Right. 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 These might have been uh, maybe new recruits right. or something. Right. I think that's what it was. Well, against his better judgment, McDowell commenced campaigning. He says, all right, man, I know this probably isn't a good idea. We should probably wait as long as we can to get these guys trained. But I'm getting political pressure. I'm getting uh, press pressure. I'm getting civilian pressure. Pressure all around on three fronts. Got to do something. Right. And the only thing you got to make sure these guys know how to do is shoot <laughs> and clean. Their, make sure their gun's clean. Because those guns back in the day, a little bit of dirt, that cap don't go off. You're mm -hmm. fucked. Or your powder gets wet. Well, I left my powder out while it was raining. Well, guess what? You have you no better, weapon. You better go bayonet the shit out of somebody. <laughs> You better sharpen up with that bayonet. <laughs> I can't because I used it as a shovel and I left it in the dirt, so now it's all rusted. <laughs> hey, even better. Right. Jab them and now they're infected. I don't think they're worried about being infected if they're right. getting jabbed with a jab or a bayonet. <laughs> you might want to get that checked out. Just jabbed him in the heart. He's dead. He's going to get infected. During the previous year, <laughs> United States Army Captain Thomas Jordan set up a pro Southern spy network in Washington City, including Rose O'Neill Greenhow a prominent socialite with a wide range of contacts. He provided her with a code for messages. After he left to join the Confederate Army, he gave her control of his network, and he continued, but continued to receive reports from her. It's like, I'm going to give you control, but tell me, send me some telegrams. Telegram! <laughs> 9th of July and the 16th of July, Greenhow passed secret messages to Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard containing critical information regarding military movements for what would be the first battle. A bull run. Ooh, so Confederate kind of knew what was going on. It was about huh? five days before the war, too. Right. Yeah. right. Including the plans of General McDowell. What a, what a, I hope she got shot in oh, the head. Was no, yeah, treason. On Bitch. July 16th, McDowell departed from Washington with the largest field army yet gathered on the North American Ooh. continent ever. About 35,000 men. Dang. Uh, McDowell's plan was to move westward in three columns and make a divisionary diversionary attack on the Confederate line at Bull Run with two columns, while the third column moved around right. the right flank to the south, cutting right. the railroad to Richmond and threatening the rear of the Confederate Army. Yes. So two from the front, one from the rear. They can't retreat. They had a good good uh, plan of attack there. I don't think they uh, was expecting as many Confederate troops no. as they uh, came back. No. So they got a good plan of attack here. You know, we come in, we'll flank them on both sides, and then we come around. And they ain't retreating. Nope. They can't retreat. Well, they can, but no, they ain't. We're gonna make them retreat to a specific spot, <laughs> like uh, like cattle. Right, gonna herd them into the fucking pen. Right, pretty much. He assumed that Confederates would be forced to abandon Manassas Junction and fall back to, like I said, the Rappahannock, the Rappahannock River, the next defensible line in Virginia. 
which would relieve some of the pressure on the United States capital. So he was hoping, hey, if we can just draw him back to the Rappanakanakanak River, we can relieve Put some of that Washington pressure. Washington at ease a little bit, you know? Right, right. And they ain't going to move any forward, so we'll be all right from there. And then we can move on to our next mission. McDowell had hoped to have his army at Centerville by the 17th of July. But the troops, unaccustomed to marching, moved in starts <laughs> and stops <laughs> along the route. Soldiers often broke ranks to wander off to pick apples and blackberries. Oh, jeez. <laughs> or to get water. So they didn't take none of this serious. Could you imagine? Like, you're trying to, to lead. Camp? You're trying to lead this. Right. You're trying to lead this, like, right. marching army. And then you look back. Right. And you literally got people fucking picking apples right. and blueberries and blackberries and shit. <laughs> like, what the fuck? That's like going to boot camp for World War II or, or Vietnam or whatever. And, and while you're training, just wander off. Well, you, you not even get, while you're training, while you're right. while you're right. going to a fucking place, and you just wander off to a, like a random shop on the side of the road or something. And they all did this, you know. Uh, they went off and did their things, and guess what? When their officers uh, that are higher ranked to them, they said stop. They said <laughs> these blackberries are so good, <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with this fresh spring water. <laughs> so great. Well, meanwhile, the Confederate Army. I'm going to build a fire here and make some jam or something. Okay. You guys, I'll along. catch up with you guys. Hey, you got any bread left or anything? <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, the Confederate Army of the Potomac under Bow Rider was encamped near Manassas Junction, where he prepared a defensive position along the south bank of the Bow Run River with his left guard in a stone bridge, approximately 25 miles from the United States Capitol. Ooh, 25 miles. <sighs> McDowell planned to attack this numerically inferior enemy army. All right. Union Major General Robert Patterson's 18,000 men engaged Johnson's force. The Army of the Shenandoah right. at 8,884 effectives, augmented by Major General Theophilus, Theophilus General H. Holmes, Holmes, General Holmes. Of brigade, his brigade of 1,465. Everybody knows General Holmes. Um, in the Shen- Shenandoah Valley, which prevented them from reinforcing Beauregard. So. We don't know about Shenandoah here late in a few, too, so. We will. Don't worry. So they cut off their little reinforcements right here for Beauregard. So so far, everything's going good. Well, the Confederate knows what the Union's doing in advance anyway after that lady. The little snitch bitch. The little snitch bitch. After two days of marching slowly in the sweltering heat, the Union Army was allowed to rest in Centerville, uh, Virginia. Okay. In Virginia. Right. Uh, McDowell reduced the size of his army to approximately 31,000 by dispatching Brigade General Theodore Runyon with 5,000 troops to protect the army's rear. Mm. He's like, you know what? I want you to hang back a little bit. We're resting, so you guys need to be on lookout behind us. Right. And you guys stay there and right. let us march forward. Maybe every 12 hours or so, move up four or five miles. In the meantime, McDowell searched for a way to outflank Beauregard, who had drawn up his lines along Bull Run. 18th of July, the Union commander sent a division under Brigade General Daniel Tyler to pass on a Confederate right, which was the southeast. So you see, he goes, the Confederate right flanks over there. I want you to pass. You want to go around them and set up shop on the right, right. of them. And right. check out anything and send back whatever you see, whatever kind of uh, route we can take or whatever kind of route they can. Let us well, know. In a battle that we should have covered last week that got deleted, Tyler was drawn into a skirmish at Blackburn's Ford, which was the battle immediately preceding Bull Run, and he made no headway. Mm-hmm. Also, on the morning of July 18th, Johnson had received a telegram suggesting he go to Beauregard's telegram. assistance if possible. Uh. Um, Johnson marched out of Winchester about noon while Stewart's cavalry screened the movement from Patterson. Patterson was completely deceived. Yes, he was. One hour after Johnson's departure, Patterson telegraphed Washington. He says, I have succeeded in accordance with the wishes of the general in chief in keeping General Johnson's force at Winchester. No, you haven't. I don't know where you're getting your info from, buddy. He's gone out of Winchester. Right. How do they not know that? Well, they got some shitty scouts. They need to figure something out here because uh, whatever they're doing is not working. For the. Right. Right. For the maneuver to be successful, McDowell felt he needed to act quickly. Of course he did. He had already begun to hear rumors that Johnston had slipped out of the valley and was headed for Manassas Junction. Oh, he did. <laughs> if, the rumor, if the rumors were true, McDowell might soon be facing 34,000 Confederates instead of the lowly 22,000. Uh. <laughs> Either way, that's a big army right there. Just for one little battle, that's humongous. 
Another reason for quick action was McDowell's concern that the 90-day enlistments of many of his regiments were about to expire. And <laughs> they're like in the middle of battle, like, nope. <laughs> He's like, in a few days, I will lose many thousands of the best of this force. They've been here for nine days. <laughs> they're the best. <laughs> Probably, uh, maybe, yeah. 90 days of training makes you the best of the force. Mm. And these guys were like, yeah, I'm good. A lot of them, I guarantee it. He was like, I'm about well, to lose. you got to remember, a lot of those volunteers were still members of militias and right. um, volunteer units and states and shit. So they knew how to do things. Right, and I'm sure most of them anyway would stick around. But like, And a lot of them, I'm sure, fought in the Indian wars and all the other wars, Spanish war. Right. I mean, there's so many wars in 1800s. Dude. A lot of these guys had to stick around anyway. You're right. not going to lose that many. I mean, some, but you would think they want to stick around. They volunteered for a reason. Right. He wrote Washington on the eve of, of the battle that he was going to lose many of thousands of his force. Right. He was right. Like, in fact, the next morning, two of units, two units of McDowell's command, their enlistments expiring that day would turn a deaf ear to McDowell's appeal to stay a few days. Oh, later. geez, I just, I just, oh, they just no. proved me wrong, didn't right. they? <laughs> <laughs> I was even saying these guys would stay because they oh, wanted me. Oh no, nope. They're like, nah. Instead, the sounds of battle, they would march back to Washington to be mustered out of service. Wow, I don't blame them, dude. <laughs> like, I don't know about this. They're like, this ain't what I signed up for, we guys. Just marched three days. You guys told us we were just gonna come here and show fucking show our muscles and then go Which home. Should have been done with this already. Guess right. what? I don't want my actual muscles to show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, out. Becoming more frustrated, McDowell resolved to attack the Confederate left flank instead, instead of the right. He planned to attack with Brigadier General Daniel Tyler's Daniel Tyler's division at Stonebridge on the Warrenton Turnpike and send the divisions of Generals David Hunter and Samuel P. Henselman over Sudley Springs Ford. Okay. From here, these divisions could outflank the Confederate line and march the Confederate rear. Okay. All right. So he was like, forget uh, flanking on the right. We're going to go to the left flank instead, and then we're going to go up the rear. Mm, I don't know if that's a very good idea. Uh, well, we well the right out. clearly couldn't do anything for them because yeah, they already yeah. screwed that up. I'm thinking the left's not going to do very much of a good <laughs> thing for him either. The brigade of Colonel Israel B. Richardson would harass the enemy at Blackburn's Ford, preventing them from thwarting the main attack. Patterson would tie down Johnston in the Shenandoah Valley so that reinforcements could not reach the area. Although McDowell had arrived at a theoretically That's sound the plan. plan. That's not what happened, right. It had a number of flaws. Mm. It was one that required synchronized execution of troop movements and attacks, skills that had not been developed in the, in the nascent army. Mm. It relied on actions by Patterson that he had already failed to take, Finally, McDowell had delayed long enough that Johnston's Valley Force, who had trained under Stonewall Jackson, so you know they're pretty damn good, was able to board trains at Piedmont Station and rush to Manassas Junction to reinforce Beauregard. So now these guys are on a rail. Instant. Instant there. Instantly. This guy's ain't stupid. On July 19th through the 20th, significant reinforcements bolstered the Confederate lines behind Bull Run. Johnson arrived with all of his army except for the troops of Brigade General Kirby Smith, who were still in transit. Right. Most of the new arrivals were posted in the vicinity of Blackburn's Ford, and Beauregard's plan was to attack from there to the north toward Centerville. Johnson, the senior officer, says, So, I'm Johnson, the senior officer, and I approve this plan. <laughs> right. So, this is why I think uh, it worked out so well for the Confederates, because they knew the Union was coming down. And the Confederates are like, well, they don't know we have so many people here. So how about we just move forward as well? I mean, obviously. Oh. Prevent them from coming to us. Right. Fuck it. We'll come to them. Meet in, we, oh, you mean? We'll meet in, in the middle. middle. <laughs> I need the bull I'll run. start marching your way. Uh, You'll, You'll start, start marching, marching mine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll meet at the bull run. And we'll blow off some heads. <laughs> if both of the armies had been able to execute their plans simultaneously, it would have resulted in a mutual counterclockwise movement as they attacked each other's left flank. <laughs> right, they would have went <laughs> instant. They would have went like that right. and they would have just moved around. That's funny. McDowell was, <laughs> McDowell was getting contradictory information from his intelligence agents. He was like, none of any of you guys told me even at remotely uh, lined up with each other. Right, like, uh, why am I getting all this uh, information that's different? I don't get it. So he called for the balloon, the balloon. So he called for the balloon enterprise, which was being demonstrated by uh, Professor Thaddeus S. C. Lowe in Washington, before an aerial reconnaissance. 
Reconnaissance? Reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. Uh, damn, they're throwing out uh, hot air balloons to do some <laughs> reconnaissance, dude. That's good. <laughs> All right, so our key... What the fuck's a balloon enterprise? The balloon? It's a hot air balloon named Enterprise. Are you sure? Yes. What else would it be? Oh, okay, yeah, I see now. Right. To get the area, right, yeah, lay out. going over the thing to and see then what the hell is back, going on. And he comes back and goes, I don't know. I've seen, uh, I don't know. I've seen some gatherings. Well, our key <laughs> union general is what we just established was Brigade General, the commanding general, Irvin McDowell. In case you guys didn't know who we were talking about, they're like, oh, Stewart. This is for the union, right. Brigade General Daniel Tyler, Brigade General David Hunter, right. Brigade General Samuel Samuel P. Heinzelman. Heinzelman. Remember these names, so when you hear these names, you know it's union. Brigade General Theodore Runyon. Union. Colonel Dixon Miles. Union. Major General. General Robert Patterson. Union. That's our union uh, commanders here. Our uh, lead guy is Irvin McDowell. Right. Well, McDowell, McDowell's Army of Northeastern Virginia was organized into five intervi- in- know that. infantry divisions of three to five brigades each. Right. Each brigade p- p- contained three to five infantry regiments. Right. An artillery battery was generally assigned to each brigade. Right. The total number of union troops present at the first battle of Bull Run, uh, we told you, 35,000, but only 18,000 were actually engaged. Mm-hmm. Uh, first division of Brigade General Daniel Tyler was the largest in the Army, contained four brigades, led by General Robert Shank. We've heard his name before. Yep. Colonel Erasmus Keys, Colonel William Sherman. Sherman, we know. And we, we will Colonel, know Sherman here in a little while. Well, we will. And we've already heard him already. And Colonel Israel B. Richardson. The second division of Colonel David Hunter had two brigades. These were led by Colonels Andrew Porter and Ambrose Burnside. Uh, Burnside is going to become a major factor as a general. And the third division was Colonel... Samuel P. Heinzelman included three brigades, which was led by Colonels William Franklin, Orlando Wilcox, and Oliver O. Howard. Yeah, I don't think those guys really did too much. Mm. But, Our fourth division, yeah. Theodore Runyon, ran that one with uh, without brigade organization and right. not engaged. Right. So, so he didn't engage. It contained Six. seven regiments of New Jersey and one regiment of New York Volunteer Infantry. Okay. Our fifth division was Colonel Dixon Miles, included two brigades, commanded by Colonels Louis Blanker and Thomas Davies, while McDowell organized the Army of Northeastern Virginia, a smaller Union command was organized and stationed northwest of Washington near Harper's Ferry, Ferry, commanded by Major General Robert Patterson. 18,000 men of the Department of Pennsylvania protected against a Confederate incursion from the Shenandoah Valley. All right, so. Patterson had 14,000 Gs, though, huh? A lot of people. Well, let's take a look at the... uh... There's graphs and stuff you can see breakdown of... uh, Artillery, men, infantry, right. all that stuff from right. each militia, each regiment, all that stuff. Right. But we're not going to go through that, obviously. Unlike the Union, the key Confederate generals, well, the Confederate like to keep their uh, chain of command <laughs> yeah. short. Apparently. Uh, We've seen, what, five, six guys up in the U.S.? Uh, six that were... Di- at that time. That, that were division leaders. And right. then you had, like, seven or eight more that For were that. colonels and all that shit under right. them. Yeah, right. right. So all we're getting from the Confederate as the major key players, of course, we get Brigade General Beauregard with his Army of the Potomac. Then we get uh, Brigade General Johnston, Joseph E. Johnston, and his Army of the Shenandoah, mm-hmm. which are both pretty decent-sized armies anyway, so I guess that's all you really needed. Uh, the Army of the Potomac, which was organized into six infantry brigades, with each brigade containing three to six infantry regiments. Artillery batteries were assigned to various infantry brigades. Various, not various, all. not all, right? The total number of troops in the Confederate Army of the Potomac was approximately 22,000. Mm-hmm. Bogard's army also contained 39 pieces of field artillery and a regiment of Virginia Cavalry. Nice. That's a good little, nice little uh, brigade right there. The Army of the Potomac was organized into seven infantry brigades. These were 1st Brigade under uh, Brigade General Bonham, 2nd Brigade under Brigade General Ewell, 3rd Brigade under Brigade General Jones, 4th Brigade under Brigade General James Longstreet, everybody knows Longstreet, 5th General, 5th uh, General, 5th <laughs> Brigade under Colonel Philip Cock, 6th Brigade under Colonel <laughs> Jubel Early, Jubel Early, 7th Brigade under Colonel Nathan Evans. I think the only ones that became a uh, colonel, I mean, a general out of those is none of them. Mm, maybe Long Street, No, Longstreet's all right. No, I don't think so. Longstreet's already a general. I don't know. We'll see, won't we? Uh, and then we got Reserve Brigade under Brigade General uh, Holmes. So he's <laughs> a reserve guy back there. 
Well, meanwhile, the Army of the Shenandoah was also organized into brigades, obviously. It was consisted of four brigades of three to five infantry regiments each, which totaled approximately 12,000 men. Nice. Each brigade was assigned one artillery battery. In addition to the infantry, there were 20 pieces of artillery and about 300 Virginia cavalrymen wow. under Colonel J.E.B. Stewart. Colonel Stewart. Although the combined strength of both Confederate armies was about 34,000, again, only 18,000 were actually engaged at the battle. The Army in Shenandoah consisted... The army in Shenan uh, the army of Shenandoah condis- <laughs> the army of Shenandoah consisted of four infantry brigades. The first one commanded by Brigade General Thomas Jackson. Jackson. Uh, second brigade commanded by Colonel Francis S. Bartow. Bartow, everybody knows them. Third brigade commanded by Brigade General Bernard E. B. Mm. Bernard B. Yeah. B. B. Fourth brigade commanded by Brigade General Edmund Kirby Smith. And then again, they have the breakdown of each of the. Um, Batteries and all that stuff of the right. Confederate uh, brigade. So <clears throat> nice. That's how our army stacks up against each other. So eighteen thousand against eighteen thousand, right. pretty much. But as you can see, even in the different brigades, first brigade, second brigades of all the Confederate ones, there was only one man commanding each one of them. In right. the Union, for the they had at least two men for each brigade, right. and then like six or seven right. higher ups than that. So there's so many chains of command in the Union. So I'm sure, like, a lot of fucking shit got lost in their commands and all that stuff where you have one one person per unit or per brigade in the Confederate. Well, it's just like nowadays, back in the day, even Vietnam or whatever. Look at those. Watch a movie. Well, each each platoon, right? They had got their, their own, own little right. leaders, and they go way up, 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 and up, and up, and up. That was the problem. Platoon is actually a perfect, perfect example of how authority... And corruption, and not ha- having too much authority, not knowing what's going on. That guy was just a freak. Yeah, but you have to have squad leaders. It's not like the general's right. going to be over everybody. You have to have your division leaders and your platoon leaders, and, and hope all that, that they stuff. follow your well, out in the field. They become the general when they're was, well, right? They wartime. are commanding officer pretty right. much in the field. Um, yeah, but those situations like that were few and far in between. It's true. It's true. But if some of them would act a little better, maybe the Vietnam War would have went a little different. Could have. Doubt Instead it. of drinking and smoking. Uh, uh, That's what they did. That was the U- that was the United States fault. Right. They sent them so much booze and everything else. Well, the pot they're getting from Vietnam, Vietnam were fucking uh, That's not all poison. they were getting. Yeah, they're getting crabs and pot. Not all they were getting. STDs. For sure, like opium and all that shit oh, was in uh, Vietnam, dude. Ridiculous. Of course they were giving it. They wanted their women to fucking get with these guys. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, check this shit out. And they're like, oh, this is nice. Right, did we look up something? The, how many uh, people from Vietnam got sexually transmitted diseases oh, and these yeah. diseases, diseases yeah, yeah, like right. that? Oh, thousand, yeah. Million. Yeah. So, yeah, of course. The stupidest thing that they could have ever done is allow these troops to go into towns like that and uh, have off days and uh, be with hookers and shit like that. Dude. Like, you don't think that what exactly what they're doing? In the middle of war, right. And they're going down to local towns and right. drinking in bars and shit like that. No. Hey, guess what? You guys get the weekend off. Do what you want. Be back here by 0400 on Monday, though. Yep. Well, this is 0400. No, actually, it's not 0400. It's 0230. 0230. On the morning of July 21st, 1861. The day of battle. McDowell sent the divisions of Hunter and Heinzel's men. About 12,000 men from Centerville at 2.30 a.m. marching to southwest on the Warrington Turnpike and then turning northwest toward Sudley Springs. So they just did a big loop, try to come up from the rear, it sounds like. Southwest and then turn northwest, yeah. Uh, To get around the Confederates, yeah, to get around the Confederates left. Tyler's division, about 8,000, marched directly toward the Stone Bridge. The inexperienced units immediately developed logistical problems. They didn't know what the hell they, they were don't doing. know what the hell's going on. How do you have... I don't understand why... They don't know the layout of no, this no, land and not. shit, dude? No. I mean, come on. I mean, these guys are... Coming. They were still America. <laughs> yeah. They don't know the layout. Well, Most of these people are coming from their little farms that they've never left. Well, the generals should. Right. <laughs> hey. Jeez. Like, I think we go that way. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, Tyler's division blocked the advance of the main flanking column on the turnpike. Later units found the approach roads to Sudley Springs were inadequate, inadequate, little more than a cart path in some places, and did not begin fording Bull Run until 9.30 a.m. Wow. Tyler's- Why do they think there's going to be a wide-open highway to get in these places? 
Tyler's men reached the Stone Bridge around 6 a.m. At 5.15 a.m., Richardson's brigade fired a few artillery rounds across Mitchell's Ford on the Confederate right, some of which hit Beauregard's headquarters in the Wilmer McLean house mm-hmm. as he was eating breakfast. So this oh, guy. Alerting him to the fact that his offensive battle plan had been preempted. Oh, so they actually kind of surprised him. So he's eating breakfast, and now he's hearing these. He's like, oh, shit. <laughs> He's like, oh, I wasn't expecting these guys so fast. He finished his last bite. He's like, well, that's sooner than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. Basically, that's how they were, that little thing right there. That's a real picture. Uh-huh. Both of these. Ridiculous. Yelling at each other and stuff. Well, nevertheless, he ordered demonstration attacks toward uh, north toward the Union left at Centerville. Bungled orders and poor communications prevented their execution, though. So now we got the south. Not uh, understanding orders, mm-hmm. even though these guys knew what was going on, and they're well. On. To be honest, caught him off guard a little bit, so right. he probably hurried up and right. You know. Although he intended for Brigade General Richard Ewell to lead the attack, Ewell at Union Mills Ford was simply ordered to hold in readiness to advance at moment's notice. <laughs> even though he was supposed to go, <laughs> right? Brigade General D- Doctor, I was going to say Doctor Jill. <laughs> Brigade General D.R. Jones was supposed to attack in support of UL, but found himself moving forward alone. Aww. Holmes was also supported to support. Holmes was also supposed to, to oh my goodness. <laughs> Holmes was also supposed to, I can't, I was going to keep on. Supposed to support. Right, that's a lot. <laughs> it is. It's a weird thing there, okay. Supposed to support, supposed right. to support. <laughs> Holmes was also supposed to support. But received no orders at all. Jeez, so uh, the other guy was like, "I'm just gonna." He don't know. He's like, "I'm gonna keep on going." Yeah, These guys going. should be ahead of us about a mile. We should be meeting them, meeting up there. Don't worry, guys. Right. We'll meet don't him. Don't worry, and they get right. there. What the hell? Well, all that stood in the path of the twenty thousand Union soldiers converging on the Confederate left flank were Colonel Nathan Shanks Evans no. and his reduced brigade of eleven hundred oh, men. No, Evans had moved some of his men to intercept the direct threat from Tyler at the bridge. <sighs> But he began to suspect that the weak attacks from the Union Brigade of General Robert Shank were merely feints. So he's like, these, these guys are nothing. <laughs> they outnumber us and they suck. All that stood in the path of 20,000 guys. <laughs> was 1,100 men. Was 1,100 men. Wow. The weak attacks from the Union Brigade of General Robert C. Shank were merely feints. Yeah. These so guys didn't know what they're, they're doing. Like, he's like, look at these guys. It's 20,000 deep and this is what they do to us. Right. He was then informed of the main Union flanking movement through Sudley Springs by Captain Edward Porter Alexander, Beauregard's signal officer, observing from eight miles southwest on Signal right, like Hill. I'm saying, these guys are all up on hills eight miles, ten miles out from battle, right. and they're just observing everything. Dude. Right. And they're like sending a guy on horseback to go, you go over there and deliver these orders real quick. I don't worry about yeah. 25 minutes, he'll get yeah. that order. Well, eight miles shouldn't be that hot on a horse. Oh, about do about 10 minutes 10 15, 15 minutes 15, yeah. 15 20 and the first use of wigwag semaphore signaling in combat what the fuck is that right what's wigwag semaphore signaling 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 <laughs> <laughs> i can't even look <laughs> wigwag is a flag signal Oh, so they're probably like, uh, <laughs> wave it some certain way. There's a historical form of flag signaling that passes messages by waving a single flag. It differs from flag semaphore that it uses one flag rather than two, and the symbols for each letter. Oh, so it's like on the sidelines of a football game right. where they're holding up the cue cards and shit. Right, and at night they much. use torches instead of flags. Uh, wigwag torches and kerosene canteen and a signal rocket. Nice. Uh, okay, so good yeah. for them. Yep, yep. Smart. Smart. I mean, what else are you going to do, right? Right. I mean, yeah. First use of wigwag semaphore signaling in combat, though. Huh? Nice, though. Everybody's like, what's that guy doing? I don't know. He's crazy. <laughs> what is it doing flag dancing? Right. Alexander sent the message. Look out for your left. Your position is turned. Ooh. How the Evan- hell did they get that from flag waving? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, dang. Jeez. Evans hastily. Le- Why don't they have... Morse code. Uh, doop, doop, boop, 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 beep, 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 beep. I don't know. Uh, right. I don't think you got to have power. Yeah, you got to have some kind of a something. That's crazy. Morse code. I don't think they had Morse code in 1865. Of course they did. No. Evans hastily led 900 of his men from their position. They didn't even have power in 1865. Uh, did they? I don't think they had power, but until... And, like, well, 18... not in more, most places, anyways. I don't think there's sure, power in the like, 1880s. Well, uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin invented electricity, so they had it in the 1700s for show. Benjamin Franklin? Yeah. The one with the kite, motherfucker. Right, so they probably did, like, some sort of... It was uh, oil generated or some shit. Oh, yeah, even though they never weren't in the fucking middle of uh, Sudley um, River or whatever. Right. Yeah, 
there's no maybe who knows uh evans hastily led 900 of his men from their position fronting the stone bridge to a new location on the slopes of matthews hill a low rise to the northwest of his previous position mm. so you know now they have to get back now they have to leave the positions what they planned on the whole time <clears throat> and go to other positions. Oh, yep. The shit got spoiled, but the Confederate delaying action on Matthews Hill included a spoiling attack, which was launched by Major Robert O. Wheat's 1st Louisiana Special Battalion, which was named Wheat's Tigers. Nice. After Wheat's command was thrown back and Wheat seriously wounded, Evans received reinforcement from two other brigades under General Bernard B. and Colonel Francis Bartow, bringing the force on the flank to 2,800 men. Okay. They successfully slowed Hunter's lead brigade and its attempts to ford Bull Run and advance across Young's Branch at the northern end of Henry Hill House, or Henry House Hill. Um, so, so they're holding them back. They're, uh, no, the the Confederates are kind of on, on their heels right now. No, they successfully slowed Hunter's lead brigade. Yeah, that's... Uh, and its attempt to ford Bull Run. So yeah, that's Burnside. Burnside is a uh, Confederate, and so is B. Right. Right, so... The, B and Bartow... These guys... Successfully slowed Hunter's lead brigade. Right, which is... Part of uh, Ambrose's or Ambrose Burnside's fucking infantry regiment. Burnside is Union. No, oh, is Rhode Island, Union? bud. Union soldier. Oh, he is Union. That's yes. right. Burnside is Union. Duh. They slowed right, Hunter's right, lead right, brigade. Right, 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 right. right from right, they right, right, they right, prevented right, him from crossing Ford to Ford Bow Run. Right, 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 right. right so right. they slowed him down. So they're uh, slowing them down. Get it. One of Tyler's brigade commanders, Colonel William Tecumseh Sherman, William Sherman. Move forward from the stone bridge around 10 a.m. and cross at an unguarded ford and struck the right flank of the Confederate defenders. How can you have a ford that's unguarded? Right. Like, this is the, one of the few places they can cross the river right, right here, so why would we guard it? <laughs> yeah. This surprise attack, coupled with pressure from Burnside and Major General Skies, or Sykes, collapsed the Confederate line shortly after 11.30 a.m., sending them in disorderly retreat to Henry House Hill. So, like I said, the Confederates on their heels right now. Well... Now they are, but this guy, they prevented right. them from fording there. But right. then, yeah. Tyler's brigade commanders, Tecumseh Sherman, went to another spot and was like, we can get around here. Maybe they got greedy or a little cocky. Mm -hmm. As they retreated from their Matthews Hill position, the remainder of Evans, Bees, and Bartow's commands received some cover from Captain John D. Embodden and his battery of four to six, four to six, of four six-pounder guns. He's like, don't worry, I got your back with these big mm -hmm. boys who held up, who held off the Union advance. So, yeah, they're sending them uh, right now, the um, Confederate line at... Uh, so the Confederate line the, the Confederate retreated. The Confederate uh, action at Matthews Hill is gone. They were sending them disorderly retreat into Henry House Hill. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman moved forward from the stone bridge that the Union was at around 10 a.m., crossed at an unguarded ford, and struck the right flank of the Confederate soldiers. Why uh, was the ford unguarded? We don't we know. We don't know. The surprise attack, coupled with pressure from Burnside and Major George Sykes, collapsed the Confederate line shortly after 11 a.m., sending them in disorderly retreat to Henry House Hill. Ooh. And as they retreated from their Matthews Hill position, the remainder of Evans, Bees, and Bartow's commands, these are all... Uh, Either brigade generals or majors or anything like that Colonels. in the uh, Confederates, Confederates uh, camp here. Uh, their commands received some cover from Captain John D. Embodden. Embodden and his battery of four six-pounder guns who held off the Union advance while Confederates attempted to regroup on Henry House Hill. Okay, so those, uh, those six-pounders did end up being... Uh, very useful. I would assume so. They were met by Generals Johnson and Beauregard, who had just arrived from Johnson's headquarters at the M. Lewis farm. These dudes were just using farmhouses and uh, like that shit just to, like, all right, clear off the dining room table. We got to put our map down. Damn right. Uh, he called it Portacy, his headquarters at the M. Lewis farm. Fortunately for the Confederates, McDowell did not press it advantage. His advantage and attempt to seize the strategic ground immediately. Shut what up. an idiot. He shut up. Choosing to bombard the hill with batteries of Captains James B. Ricketts of uh, Battery 1, 1st U.S. Artillery, and Charles Griffin, Battery D for the 5th U.S. Artillery okay. from Dogan's Ridge. So they're up on the ridge, wow. pounding the hell out of uh, um, Henry House Hill. Yeah, so they got the Confederates right here. They're from all sides, too. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, the Union. Everywhere. Then you got more backups over here. There's everywhere. And then you got Shank over here doing whatever the hell he's doing at the Stone Bridge. All right. All right. Yeah. So now we got them uh, converging on each other here. 
First, the uh, union get a little surprise on them, but we all know. Right. right. We all know. Brigade General Thomas J. Jackson's Virginia Brigade came up in support of the disorganized Confederates around noon. Around noon. Accompanied by Colonel Wade Hampton and his Hampton's Legion and Colonel G.E.B. Stewart. Or J.E.B. Yeah, J.E.B. Stewart's <laughs> cavalry, along with a contingent of six-pounder guns. Everybody's packing their six-pounders. Uh, yeah. The Hampton Legion, 600 people strong, managed to buy Jackson some time to construct a defensive line on a Henry House Hill by firing repeated volleys at Sherman's advancing brigade. Hampton had purchased about 400 British and rifled and field rifles to equip the men. But however, however, it is not clear if his troops had them at the bull run or if the weapons arrived after this battle. 400 British and field rifles. Good for them. Uh, right. So now British is officially our enemy. So uh, with the lack of. <laughs> or you uh, think Britain was probably selling us guns too, or the Union at least. Right? at least, right? But, uh, the North's unwillingness to uh, move forward at 1130. Yeah, idiots. Yeah, it could have changed the whole battle. Allowed them to regroup and put up defensives. Bull run might not even <sighs> been an A battle. All right. Well, if they did in so purchase, well, we know they purchased them, but if they were on the battlefield in time, they would have been the only foreign-made weapons on the field. Right. The 79th New York was thoroughly decimated by Hampton's musket fire, musket fire and began to disintegrate. Wade Hampton gestured towards their Colonel James Cameron and remarked, look at that brave officer trying to lead his men, and they won't follow him. Oh, jeez. Oh, so, yeah, they're all leaving, going away. All right. Dude, yeah, it's like, these guys are all scared. I don't blame them, but shit. Shortly afterwards, Cameron, the brother of U.S. Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, oh, was no. fatally wounded. Oh, man. Fatally. Fatally I mean, wounded. He, I mean, he dead. dead. I mean, he did. Fatally wounded. I like that better. Fatally wounded. I'm going to fatally wound you. Is that bad? It's real bad. It's real bad. As bad as you can get. It has been claimed that Hampton deliberately targeted officers of the 79th New York. Why wouldn't he not? In revenge for the death of his nephew earlier in that day. Although he had, in fact, been killed by soldiers of the 69th New York. Whatever. It's still New York. I'm pretty sure. But officers and shit like that didn't really get targeted. No, like, not really. It unless wasn't you're a... like, in front on your horse. Right. Like, they weren't going out of the way to take out an officer. No. If it happened, it happened. Right. Jackson posted his five regiments on the reverse slope of the hill, where they were shielded from direct fire, and was able to assemble 13 guns for the defensive line, which he posted on the crest of the hill. As as the guns fired, the recoil movement... Uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, no. They started to go down the reverse slope, where they could be safely reloaded. Oh, wait, what happened here? As the guns fired. Well, they did it on purpose. All right, right. So they're Smart. at the top of the hill, and they're firing the guns. That way, right. by the time they're ready to reload, they're out of view. They're right. down the hill, so all they got to do is move back up, shoot them again, come down. Oh, that's cool. Beautiful. Look at them. Meanwhile, beautiful. McDowell ordered the batteries of Ricketts and Griffin to move from Dogan's Ridge to the hill for close yeah, infantry firm? support. <laughs> law firms of Ricketts and Griffin. Ricketts and Griffin. <laughs> and my colleague Dogan. Right. Um, there are 11 guns engaged a fierce artillery artillery duel across 300 yards. That's Ooh. not very uh, far. Against Jackson's 13. pretty far, because 300 yards, no guns were shooting that far back then. Of course they were. Mm. You were lucky to get 50 yards out of a musket. Yep, none of these guys were using muskets. You'd be lucky. Some were, but not everybody had the little scopes, and them were maybe 300 yards, maybe two. Well, unlike many engagements in the Civil the, War. Uh, the six-pounders shooting? They're not shooting 300 yards. No, they might shoot 300 yards. I doubt it. I don't know. Yeah, because remember, we looked up the six-pounders. They were right. like 500 yards right, or something. Right, 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 right. So, well, unlike many engagements in the Civil War are here, the Confederate artillery had an advantage. Okay. The Union pieces were now within range of the Confederate smooth bores. Uh-oh. And the, yeah, the smooth uh, barrel. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> and the predominantly rifled pieces. Oh, and rifled. All right. But rifled are supposed to go more accurate, though, not more farther. Accurate, yeah. Right. Um. And the predominantly rifled pieces on the Union side were not effective weapons at such close ranges, they, with many shots fired over the head of their targets. Right. So they weren't more accurate. Right. They should have been. No, rifled means they go longer, longer distance. Yeah, it's rifled. That means the inside of the barrel is... Got right, a, they rifle it out. Slight, yeah. So that means, yeah, because they and makes it go longer, farther it's, distance. It should be a straighter it's, shot, though. A straighter, smooth board. straighter at longer distance, but like you see right. here at... Close range, they are, they suck. And I think the smooth bores though, they just come out with so much power, but they don't go as far. Like, but they have no choice but to go straight as right, well, too. Right, right, right. Right. Okay. Some ruins. You really can't tell. Oh, geez, dude, it's Judith Henry's house. Spring Hill. Spring Hill after the battle. 
post-war on the site of Judas Henry's, so they rebuilt the house again. Yeah, and old poor Judas Henry's grave. Mm, right there. Well, there we go. <laughs> All right. One of the casualties of the artillery fire was Judith Carter Henry, an 85-year-old widow and invalid. Meaning she's not a part of the war. Right. Uh, who was unable to leave her bedroom in the Henry house. As Ricketts began receiving rifle fire, he concluded that it was coming from the Henry <laughs> house and turned his guns on the building. Oh, no, poor lady. Maybe she was firing out the window, dude. You sure never know. Was. A shell that crashed through the bedroom wall tore off one of the windows. Oh, tore off one of the widow's feet. Jeez. Oh, and inflicted multiple injuries, from which she died later that day. Damn. Dang, get this big old cannonball come flying through your house and take off your foot. Just take it right off, dude. Mm. The enemy are driving us. B exclaimed to Jackson. Jackson, a former U.S. Army officer and professor at Virginia Military Institute, is said to have replied, Then, sir, we will give them the bayonet. Hey. Ooh, that bayonet is rough. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. B exhorted his own troops to reform by shouting, There's Jackson standing like a stone wall. Yep. Let us determine to die here, and we will conquer. Rally behind the Virginians. This explanation, exclamation was the source for Jackson's and his brigade's nickname, Stonewall. Stonewall's Jack, Stonewall's where, Brigade. This is where, uh, Jackson gets his nickname. Oh, poor Stonewall. Doesn't know what uh, turned out well for that guy. Though. No. B was shot through the stomach shortly after speaking and died the next day. Thus, it was unclear exactly what he meant. Moreover, none of his sub subordinates were wrote reports of the battle. So why didn't they? How do you not write, write reports of the battle? Right. Colonel States Rights Gist. Yeah, that's a hell of a name. States Rights. <laughs> what? Wow. States Rights Gist or gist, one of them. All right. What the hell is that, dude? That's got to be like a nickname. It has to be. There's, right. no, there's no way that's a... States uh, right. Yeah, I mean, it has to be states rights. That's why they're fighting. There's no way that that's his birth name. If so, that's a hell of a name. Might have changed it. States rights gist. Gist or... What? Gist, right? Gist. What's the gist? States rights gist was a lawyer, militia general in South Carolina, Confederate Army... His name was based on the Southern States' rights doctrine and nullification of the of Gist. He That's chose just, his son name to reflect his own political sentiments. States' rights. <laughs> so that was indeed his name. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. States' rights Gist. Gist or whatever, man. I don't, I don't know how to say it. Wow, dude. Hell of a name, boy. It might be the best name in the whole uh, armies. Good, right. for, good for him. Yeah, good for him. States rights gist or gist, gist. whatever you want to say. I'll say gist. States rights gist. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's pretty sweet, huh? Well, Colonel States rights gist, <laughs> serving as B's aide de camp, took command of the brigade after B's death. Death. Major Burnett Rett, chief of staff to General Johnston, claimed that B was an angry, angry man <laughs> he was at an Jackson's. angry little bee. <laughs> right. He was an angry little bee at Jackson's failure to come immediately to the relief of bees and Bartow's brigades while they were under heavy pressure. What do you want me to do? Go over there and... Wasn't it just bee that claimed that Jackson was standing like a stone wall and we shall die here? Right. Those who described to this opinion believe that bee's statement was meant to be... Uh, pejorative. Pejorative. Meaning... Look at Jackson standing there like a stone wall. Meaning... Uh, not approving. Right. Like, not doing nothing. Well, artillery commander Griffin decided to move two of his guns to the southern end of his line, hoping to provide enfilade fire against the Confederates. At approximately 3 p.m., these guns were overrun by the 33rd Virginia, Ooh. whose men were outfitted in blue uniforms, causing Griffin's commander, commander Major William F. Barry, to mistake them for Union troops yeah. and order Griffin not to fire on them. Right. They didn't they have the flag. Every, <sighs> everyone, not... Every brigade has a flag. You can instantly see it. Jeez. Close range volleys from 33rd Virginia, followed by Stewart's cavalry attack against the flank of the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry, uh, which was supporting the battery, killed many of the gunners and scattered the infantry. Capitalizing on this success, Stonewall Jackson ordered two regiments to charge Ricketts guns, and they were captured as well. Jeez. And this guy, he's like... If these Union guys would have done this early in the day, they would have been, all right, we would have been running. So let's not make that mistake they did. Let's just go straight forward. As an additional Federal infantry engaged, the Confederates were pushed back, and they reformed, and the guns changed hands several times. Okay, oh, so, so they were trading. Yeah, they were like, well, these six-pounders are ours. No, they're ours. No, they're ours. Right. <laughs> nice. uh, the capture of the Union guns turned the tide of the battle, which I would assume 
Although McDowell had brought 15 regiments into the fight on the hill, outnumbering the Confederates two to one. Of course it did. No more than two were ever engaged simultaneously. Oh, that's oh, really? stu- stupidity. Jackson continued to press his attacks, telling the soldiers of the 4th Virginia Infantry, reserve your fire until they come within 50 yards, then fire and give them the bayonet. And when you charge, yell like furies. Okay. And that's the rebel. The rebel yell. Yeah. 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 For the first time, Union troops heard the disturbing sound of the rebel yell. What was it? I don't know. What is no. it? Yeah, that's right. Imagine all those crazy little motherfuckers coming at you, dude. That's how it was, too, man. That's fucking nuts. Mm. Stupid war back then. They're idiots. <laughs> idiots. Wow. It's like a wild pack of coyotes or something. All right. So we heard that. First time. Rubbery out. Rubbery out. What the hell? The rubbery yell? <laughs> first time the rebel yell. For the first time, Union troops heard the disturbing sound of the rebel, rebel yell. We just said that. 4 p.m. The last Union troops were pushed off Henry Hill House. Henry House Hill by a charge of two regiments from Colonel Philip St. George Cox Brigade to the west. Shin Ridge or Chin Ridge, right? Chin? Sure. Shin Ridge was a Chin, Shin, whatever, had been occupied by Colonel Oliver Otis Howard's Brigade from Heinzelman's Division. Oh, remember Heinzelman's? Heinzelman. But the, but, at exactly 4 p.m., that's what it, it, it could be at maybe 401. Two Confederate brigades, Colonel Jubal Early's, which had moved from the Confederate right, and Brigade General Edmund Kirby Smith's, commanded by Colonel Arnold Elsie, after Smith was wounded. So he's like, you take it over, Elsie. And he's like, I got it, Smith, which had just arrived from the Shenandoah Valley. So these guys are on the move. They're probably already tired. Shenandoah is pretty far away from here, isn't it? Well, they weren't that tired because they moved forward and they crushed Howard's Brigade. Crushed them. Crushed it. So we got the uh, Confederates just like constant on the attack. Man, I bet. Uh, who's running the Union right now at this battle? McDowell. McDowell. He should have moved. He's like, I should have moved at 1130. Mm-hmm. Just kept on. Well, going. then Beauregard orders an entire line forward and the Union troops begin to panic and retreat. At 5 p.m. everywhere, McDowell's army was disintegrating. Thousands in large and small groups or as individuals begin to leave the battlefield and head for Centerville in a rout. Oh, man. McDowell rolled around the field trying to rally regiments and groups of soldiers, but most had had enough. They had They're enough. like, you know what? I think we're done here, guys. Right. I think we're done. Unable to stop the mass exodus, ma- mass exodus, McDowell gave orders for Porter's regular infantry battalion near the intersection of the Turnpike and Manassas Sudley Road okay. to act as a rear guard as the army withdrew. All right. The unit briefly held the crossroads, then retreated eastward with the rest of the army. McDowell's force crumbled and began to retreat. Oh, jeez. These guys are on a run. Hopefully they can get away fast enough. The retreat was relatively orderly up to the Bull Run crossings. And then... uh the poor management by the Union officers. It was like, e- this is getting out of hand, guys. What should we do? Just let them go, right? Murder yeah. them? I don't know. Are they, are they like deserters now? I don't know. He's ordered to retreat, so. A Union wagon was overturned by artillery fire on a bridge spanning Cub Run Creek, inciting panic McDowell's force as the soldiers streamed uncontrollably toward Centerville, discarding their arms and equipment. Oh, oh they just geez. Like everything behind. Like Biden, he's like, Let's get out of here. Afghanistan, see you later. McDowell ordered Colonel Dixon S. Miles at division to act as a rear guard, but it was impossible to rally the army short of Washington. Mm-mm. In the disorder that followed, hundreds of Union troops were taken prisoner. Jeez. That was terrible. They didn't know what to do. He didn't, he didn't, this guy didn't attack when Confederates were on the run. He let them organize again. And then, when he has to retreat, he's just like, right, let's, let's just go. Let's just run oh wherever. My. Wagons and artillery were abandoned, including the 30 pounder, whoa, 30 pounder Patriot rifle, which had opened the battle with such fanfare. Expecting an easy Union victory, the wealthy elite of nearby Washington, including congressmen and their families, had come to picnic and watch the battle. Picnic? When the Union Army was driven back in a run in disorder, the roads back to Washington were blocked by panicked civilians attempting to flee in their carriages. The pell-mell retreat became known in the southern press as the Great Skedaddle. They skedaddled right out of there. What a bunch of idiots, too. All the civilians are like, we got to go. Right. Jeez. 
the great skedaddle. I wonder if they reenact that. <laughs> Just a bunch of people running away. <laughs> right. Since, Skedaddling. Right. Them. Since their combined army had been left highly disorganized as well, Beauregard and Johnston did not fully press their advantage, despite you urging from uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Yeah, see, uh, Johnston was smart. He's like, no, we're not ready, man. Uh, he arrived at the battlefield. Yeah. He's like, I want to see this. All right. He's watching Union's retreat. He's like, yes. An attempt by Johnston to intercept the Union troops from his right flank using the brigades of Brigade General Millage Bonham and James Longstreet was a failure. The two commanders squabbled with each other, and when Bonham's men received some artillery fire from the Union's rear guard and found that Richardson's brigade blocked the road to the Centerville, he called off the pursuit. He's like, like yeah, that ain't worth it. No, we're going in near Centerville where they have way more people probably than us anyway. So right. let's just call it a win for us, huh? Yeah, in Washington, here. meanwhile, President Lincoln and members of the cabinet waited for news of a Union victory. Nope. Instead, a telegram arrived stating... General McDowell's army in full retreat through Centerville. The day is lost. Save Washington and the remnants of this army. Uh-oh. The tidings were happier in the Confederate capital, obviously. All right. From the battlefield, President Davis telegraphed Richmond, We have won a glorious but dear bought victory. All right. Night closed on the enemy in full flight and closely pursued. Okay. Good for them. One side's riding high, going to get drunk tonight, and the other side's like, man, I don't even know if we could. I don't. These I mean, guys are way stronger than we thought, man. Both these guys need to sit down and be like, <laughs> we're not leading this correctly, guys. I understand you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to be like, oh, if we lose, because you don't want to right. talk about losing or something. But right. hey, man, if it's something where we're overwhelmed and we got to retreat, how about you we do this and not just run away like right. wherever, which ways? There should be always a line of retreat that you should have mapped out. That's the common theme theme that we've been seeing in all these early battles is the disorganization and the terrible. Uh, Terrible just leadership. Running away. Yeah, the leadership is just not literally good. every battle that we've had. Either side that's losing just drops, and literally everything, everything and just runs. runs. Dude. <laughs> Jeez, the battle was a clash between relatively large, ill-trained bodies of recruits yeah. led by inexperienced officers. Well, uh, neither army commander was able to deploy his forces effectively. Although nearly sixty thousand men were present at the battle, only eighteen thousand had been actually engaged on one in, on each side. Well, I, I don't understand. There's thirty thousand on each side, and. What stopped the other 12,000 from just going out there and fighting? I mean, it's just stupid. Right. Although McDowell had been active on the battlefield, he had expected, he had expended most of his energy maneuvering nearby regiments and brigades instead of controlling and coordinating the movements of his army as a whole. Right. You should leave the maneuvering right. of regiments and brigades to those All right. That's why you guys, have, uh, the Regiment, colonels and yeah, the brigadier yeah, generals come and shit. On, man. Get the hell out of here. Well, other factors contributed to McDowell's defeat, which were Patterson's failure to hold Johnston in the valley. I mean, that was a good one. McDowell's two day delay at Centerville. That's know, even worse. Allowing Tyler's division to lead the march on 21st of July, thus delaying the flanking divisions of Hunter and Heinzelman. Mm-hmm. And the two and a half, two plus two hour delay, the two plus two hour delay after the Union victory on Mathers Hill, Matthews Hill, which oh. allowed the Confederates to bring up the reinforcements oh, yeah. and establish a defensive position, right? Because remember, they right. they surprised them, and then they waited two hours right. to come and do anything? Dummies. Idiots, dude. Jeez. On Henry Hill, Beauregard had also limited his control to the regiment regimental level, generally allowing the battle to continue on its own and only reacting to Union moves. Jeez. Johnston's decision to transport his infantry to the battlefield by rail played a major role in in the Confederate victory. Well, obviously, right. they're going to be uh, very uh, well-rested. Right. Although the trains were slow and a lack of sufficient cars did not allow the transport of large numbers of troops at, at one time, almost all of his army arrived in time to participate in the battle. Yeah, we get participation trophies. Right. After reaching Manassas, Junction, Johnson had relinquished command of the battlefield to Beauregard, but his forwarding of reinforcements to the scene of fighting was decisive. Okay. Jackson and B's brigades had done the largest share of fighting in the battle, where Jackson's brigade had fought almost alone for four hours and sustained... Right. Sustained over fifty percent of casualties. Wow, that's a lot. He, that's one thing I know is about wow. Jackson too. He loses a lot of uh, his his because uh, he's just sending him out there, dude. Right. Fight, fight, fight. Well, the majority of the time, uh, he wins his battles. Bull Run Up was until, the largest. Uh, right? Wasn't he the one they chased into the Blue Mountains? Yeah, somewhere in Chattanooga, wasn't it? I don't know. Somewhere over there, man. Friendly fire, bud. Mm-hmm. Bull Run was the largest and bloodiest battle in the United States history up until this point. Yes, sir. That's even with uh, the Boston Massacre and all that, whatever it was. 
Union casualties were 460 killed, 1,124 wounded, 1,312 missing or captured, so you can add at least 70% of that are dead. Confederate casualties were 387 killed, 1,582 wounded, and 13 missing. They only had 13 missing? Jeez. Wow. A very high 10% casualty rate of the troops engaged in battle, excluding missing or captured. That is high. Yeah. Uh, among the Union... I mean, you're fighting. You can you smell each other's breaths when you're shooting at each other. Jeez. Among the Union dead was Colonel James Cameron. We know that. The brother of President Lincoln's first Secretary of War. We know that. Among the Confederate casualties was Colonel Francis S. Bartow, mm-hmm. the first Confederate brigade commander to be killed in the Civil War. General B. was mortally wounded and died the following day. So they lost. So two high-ranking guys for the Confederates. Lost a colonel and they lost a general. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, compared to later battles, casualties at First Bow Run had not been especially heavy. Right. Compared to later, yeah. Both Union and Confederate killed, wounded, and missing were a little over 1,700 each. Right. Two Confederate brigade commanders, Jackson and Edmund Kirby Smith, were wounded in the battle. Jackson was shot in the hand. Oh, look at that. He was shot in the hand, and so he remained on the battlefield. Right. No Union officers above the regimental level were killed. Two division commanders, Samuel Heinzelman and David Hunter, and one brigade commander, Orlando Wilcox, were wounded. Okay, so we got some higher-ups. Yeah. Got we, some shrimp, huh? We discussed uh, got some shrimp, huh? the um, killed and stuff, but there are charts that go by killed, wounded, and missing, and right. whatever uh, each, each regiment and... Brigade for Calver or uh, Union and Confederates. So if you want to go look them up. Right. Following the loss at Bull Run, Union diarist George Templeton Strong wrote, Today will be known as Black Monday. We are utterly and disgracefully routed, beaten, whipped by successionists. <laughs> hey, what are you going to do, bud? David Detzer uh, wrote in Donnybrook. Donnybrook's like a magazine or something, right? Sure. If the war had turned out to be of short duration, Bull Run would have been a disaster for the Union. But if, as now seemed more plausible, a long and nasty war is inevitable. Was. That battle had a curiously salutary effect for Union side. It did. It provided a wake-up call for those optimists like Seward or even Lincoln who had hoped for or counted on a quick result. Everybody thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. Everybody thought it was going to be such an easy little diddly do it all day. Lincoln saying, oh, Confederate States who? Confederate States what? President Jefferson Davis? Well, no. Meanwhile, in uh, his book, Turning Points of the Civil War, James A. Rowley wrote, Bull Run was a turning point in the American Civil War was. in the sense that the battle struck with impelling force upon public opinion at home and abroad, right. upon Congress, and upon the Commander-in-Chief. It framed new patterns of thought and led to far-reaching changes in the conduct of the war. Uh-huh. The failure at Bull Run inspired a second Northern Rising. Uh, volunteering yeah, volunteering accelerated. 90-day men re-enlisted. States rushed fresh regiments toward forward in plentitude as they realized victory would not come readily. A new mood fastened upon Northerners. And Iron Resolve entered the northern soul. Yep. So now they're like, boys, we need to take this shit seriously, dude. After after that, all we've right. seen all those men, and we couldn't get it done. And we're supposed to be the strongest force. All right. Stronger than them? Yeah. All right. Just think what Britain's thinking of us right now. <laughs> we're weak. Union forces and civilians alike feared that Confederate forces, 14,000 of them, not engaged in the battle, would advance in Washington, D.C., oh, only 27 okay. miles away. Yep. With very little they standing. They probably right? could have, with dude. very little standing in their way. They're like, they can easily get here. July 24th, 1861. Professor Thaddeus S.C. Lowe ascended the balloon Enterprise to observe the Confederates moving in about Manassas Junction and Fairfax. He saw no evidence of massing Confederate forces, but was forced to land in Confederate territory. It was overnight before he was rescued and could report to headquarters. He reported that his observations restored confidence to the Union commanders. Mm, good for so him. like... Dude, they're not even doing anything. They're chilling at right. Bull Run. They're just like they're down they're like, there getting drunk right, right. now. They're, maybe a couple of regiments came in, but I, I, I think they're just going to hold that. Mm-hmm. They're not coming this way. Nope. The uh, the northern public was shocked at the unexpected defeat of their army with, when an easy victory had been widely anticipated. Both sides quickly came to realize that the war would be longer and more brutal than anyone had imagined. July 22nd, President Lincoln signed a bill that provided for the enlistment of another 500,000 men for up to three years of service. On July 25th, 11,000 Pennsylvanians who had earlier been rejected by the U.S. Secretary of War Uh 
for federal service in either Patterson or McDowell's command arrived in Washington, D.C. and were finally accepted. Okay. They're like, yeah, we need you. <laughs> yeah, right. Jeez. Three months after the first Battle of Bull Run, Union forces suffered another smaller defeat at the Battle of Bald Bluff near Leesburg, Virginia. The perceived military incompetence at both battles led to the establishment of the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Jeez. Right. The, uh, a congressional body created to investigate northern military affairs. So, yeah. They're, yeah, because uh, what they're doing now is like, <laughs> we really need to re- reevaluate what kind of people we got running our shit for us. Yeah. Right. And we need to like, have behind the scenes paper guys in D.C., you know, who actually are mapping this out and be like, all right, guys, this is what you guys are doing wrong. Or you're not doing this, you know, something like that, right? The War Department. Concerning the Battle of First Bull Run, the committee listed, the committee listened to testimony from a variety of witnesses connected with McDowell's army. They want to figure out how in the hell did this happen? Well, although the committee's report concluded that the principal cause of defeat was Patterson's failure to prevent Johnson from reinforcing Beauregard, Patterson's enlistment had expired a few days after the battle and he was no longer in the service. <laughs> He, Jeez, dude, he was like, I ain't coming back. Right. The northern public clamored for another scapegoat, and McDowell bore the chief blame. Of course he did. It was his army. Right. On July 25th, he was relieved of Army Command and replaced by Major General George B. McClellan, who would soon be named General-in-Chief of all the Union armies. Yep, McClellan. Yep. McDowell was also present to bear significant blame for the defeat of Major General John Pope's Army of Virginia by General Robert E. Lee um, 13 months later at the second Battle of Bull Run. Right. So they trusted him again at Bull Run? They're they like, did. I don't know about that. He's like, trust me, let me let me do this. I've been, uh, I know the layout now. It's been on my mind ever since, and I should have done things different. Right. <sighs> Give me a chance. Right. The reaction in the Confederacy was more muted. There was little public celebration as the Southerners realized that despite their victory, the greater battles that would inevitably come would mean greater losses for their side as well. Mm-hmm. He was like, that's when everybody was like, we finna die, guys. <laughs> a lot of us. Once the euphoria of victory had worn off, President Jefferson Davis called for 400,000 additional volunteers. Uh-oh. Bogard was considered the Confederate hero of the battle. Volunteers. <laughs> right. <laughs> he was considered the hero of the battle. Who was Bogard? Bogard. Was promoted that day by President Davis to full general in the Confederate Army. Oh. Stonewall Jackson. Jackson. Stonewall Jackson, arguably the most important tactical contributor to the victory, right. received no special recognition, oh. but would later achieve glory for his 1862 Valley campaign. Yeah, yeah. Is that like Shenandoah and stuff? I think it is. Uh, privately, Davis credited Greenhow with ensuring Confederate, Confederate victory. <laughs> Jeez. Jordan uh, sent a telegram to Greenhow. Our... Uh, our president and our general direct me to thank you. We rely upon you for further information. Nice. The Confederacy owes you a debt. Okay. Signed, Jordan, adju- adjutant general. Nice. Look at these. Making people feel good about right. themselves. You got to boost up their confidence. Right. The battle also had long-term psychological consequences. <laughs> you think? The decisive victory led this to is, a, Yeah, this right? is the biggest battle anybody's ever seen on American soil. So imagine, like, the scenes. Right, and, yeah. right. Uh, the decisive victory led to a, a degree of overconfidence on the part of Confederate forces and prompted a, a determined organizational effort on the part of the Union. In hindsight, commentators on both sides agreed that the one-sided outcome proved the greatest misfortune that would have befallen the Confederacy. Although modern historians generally agree that interpretation, James M. McPherson has argued that the E-spirit decorps attained by Confederate troops on the heels of their victory, together with a new sense of insecurity felt by Northern commanders, also gave Confederate military edge. And so they're saying, hey, the lack of leadership or whatever war knowledge from the North and us being lucky bastards. Let's yip yip you around, right? I don't know. <laughs> what are you even saying? <laughs> <laughs> I understood nothing you said. <laughs> None of that. <laughs> you said. <laughs> Basically, they're saying that the uh, Confederates got a little bit too big for their britches, got a little bit too overconfident, which actually uh, uh, kind of hurt them in the long run. Coming, uh, the, na- <laughs> the name of the battle has caused controversy since 1861. The Union Army frequently named battles after significant rivers. We have established that. Mm-hmm. And uh, Confederates usually named them after nearby towns or farms. Right. The U.S. Na- US National Park Service uses... The Confederate name for its national battlefield park, but the Union name, Bull Run, also has widespread currency in popular literature. Basically, yeah. you're going to hear Bull Run because that's who won the war. Right. So If it, Confederates were on the, won the war, Manassas. we'd be calling it Manassas. Manassas. Battlefield confusion between the battle flags, especially the similarity of Confederates 
Stars and Bars and the Union Stars and Stripes when it was fluttering. Oh, yeah. Led to the adoption of the Confederate battle flag. Yes, sir. Which eventually became the most popular symbol of the Confederacy and the South in general. Oh, we know that one. Yeah, first, generally. Yeah, and generally. And the first, the first Battle of Bull Run demonstrated that the war would not be won by one grand battle, and both sides began preparing for a long and bloody con- conflict. You know it. The battle also showed the need for adequately trained and experienced officers and men. Really? One year later, many of the same soldiers who had fought at first Bull Run, now combat veterans, would have an opportunity to test their skills on the same battlefield in the second Battle of Bull Run slash Manassas. Uh, yeah, they're like, they're like, yeah, we ain't going out like that again. Even though they do, as far as the Union goes. They have to, right? What? They have to go like that again, right? I'm saying we're not going out like running away and losing again, but they obviously do. <laughs> they don't run, they don't win the second bull run either. The Union doesn't. No. The first battle of Bull Run is mentioned in the novel Gods and Generals, but is depicted more fully in its film adaptation. That movie is almost four hours long, guys. And you need to watch it. Yep. Fantastic. Uh the battle forms the climax of the the film Class of Sixty One. It also appears in the first episode of the second season of the miniseries North and South. That has uh, um, Patrick Swayze and I uh, forget who else is in it. In the second episode of the first season of the miniseries, How the West Was Won. And in the first episode of the miniseries, The Blue and the Gray. Manassas, 1999, is the first volume in the James Reasoner Civil War series of historical novels. Okay, so they cover this quite a bit. Apparently, because the battle is subject, uh, the battle is described in Rebel in 1993, the first volume of Bernard Cornwell's The Starbuck Chronicles series of historical novels. The battle is described from the viewpoint of a Union infantryman in Uptown Sinclair's, Sinclair's novella Manassas, which also depicts the political turmoil leading up to the Civil War. The battle is also depicted in John Jake's The Titans, the fifth novel in the Kent Family Chronicles, a series that explores the fictional Confederate cavalry officer Gideon Kent. Um, I bet you these are all good books, too. Right. I'm sure. Oh, geez. The battle is subject of the (laughs) Johnny Horton song, Battle of Bull Run. Shaman? 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 Shaman. Second in the Cole Family Trilogy by Noah Gordon includes an account of the battle. The battle is also depicted in the song (laughs) Yankee Bayonet. By indie folk band, The Decemberist. And Murder at 1600, everybody knows that's the one with um, Wesley Snipes and uh, is Denzel Washington in that? I don't know, never seen it. <sighs> Murder at 1600, Detectives Harlan Regis, played by Wesley Snipes, has built a plan relief of the battle, which plays a certain role in the plot. Well, good for them. Nice. The National Jubilee of Peace Building at Grant and Lee Avenues in Man- Grant and Lee Avenues. Nice. They share an avenue. They come together. Huh? Look at that. Um, in Manassas, Virginia, is draped with the U.S. flag for the 150th anniversary. Oh, that's a- right. Oh, just the picture. Picture. <laughs> just the pants. The cornerstone of the commemoration event. Oh, okay, yeah. Prince William County State Special Events commemorated in the 150th anniversary of the Civil War through 2011. That's it. All right. Uh, Manassas was named the number one tourist destination in the United States for 2011. Wow. Wow. In the United States. Manassas. By the American Bus Association for its efforts in highlighting the history. Oh. So it wasn't necessarily the most people went. They're right. just saying this is the best spot to go. Right. Uh, the cornerstone of the commemoration event featured a reenactment of the battle on July 23rd to 24th of 2011. Throughout the year, there were tours of the Manassas Battlefield and other battlefields in the county and a number of related events and activities. Hmm. The city of Manassas commemorated the 150th anniversary of the battle on July 21st to the 24th. Nice. Part of the site of the battle is now Manassas National Battlefield Park, which is designated as a national battlefield park. Of course it is. I would assume more than 900,000 people visit the battlefield each year. Wow. Nice. As a historic area under the National Park Service, the park was administratively, administratively Listed on the historic of uh, register places. <laughs> the, 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 it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places on uh, October 15th, 1966, <laughs> 100 years later. Right. Jeez. Um, wow. Yeah, so that's Bull Run, I guess. Unexpected. Nobody know what to do. North should have kept on going when the rebels were retreating. Nope. Well, yeah, when they had them on their heels, well, you let the Confederates you know, regroup. Let regroup and re uh, retroop up, and then that was downhill from there. We already downhill. know. We already know that the rebels 
the Confederates like to come right at you. We've seen that in how many battles now. That's what they're going to do. So and Confederates are always known to back off first if they didn't, if they feel like they're not getting the upper hand. Yeah, to regroup. They'll back off, and then next thing you know, boom, they come in extra hard. And, mm. 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 You can be ready. Yes, sir. Ready, bayonets. Yep, yeah, that's going to do it. Battle of Bull Run, first Battle of Bull Run, parts Nances. one and two in the books. We'll be back next week for the first Battle of Masilla Ooh. in New Mexico, which took place July 25th, 1861. We depend on how long that is, which I'm not really sure. We might even have the Battle of Athens in Missouri. And Iowa. Um, okay. And then um, it'll probably just be those two because August 10th, 1861, the Battle of Wilson's Creek mm. is a uh, a Class A battle. Mm. So that's a big boy. It is. It is. It's a big boy. It's a big boy. Okay. <laughs> it's a big boy. It's a big boy. We're going to fight down in Missouri for a while. Dang. Up in Iowa? Up, up in Iowa. Dang. Dang. Getting some fighting in Iowa. Mr. Wilson. I guess not even really that um, much here either. I do a couple battles here, guys. You never know. Yeah, they don't really have a uh, uh, lot to do on. What was it? It was only one day, yeah. So I guess it's not gonna be that long. Um, right. Yeah. So maybe we'll do a couple, three battles or something. Yeah, maybe something like that. Something. Uh, Battle of Athens is only. Yeah, it's not very long, so it's more than likely we're gonna do. At least three battles right. next uh, episode. Right. And then uh, we'll move on from there. But our next major battle after Wilson's Creek is probably going to be Battle of Carnifex Ferry in West Virginia or Battle of Cheap Mountain. Our next A battle. Oh, shit. Not really many of them. What's the next one? It's going to be a long, long time. Uh, we don't have another A battle. So our last A battle of the 1861, 1861 is um, Wilson's Creek. So this is all. This is. This is just the beginning, guys. Yeah, not many battles in uh, 1861, but then when we go down to our 1862 part, it's gonna be raw. There's just nothing but battles. Dude. Deaths. There was 58, 80, over 100 and whatever battles in 1862 compared to only 40, 50 ish. Yeah, 60. Yeah, 80 in uh, 1861. So, yeah, and. Lots of Confederate wins in 1861, as we'll see coming up. But as you, well, you can't see, but we can see a lot of blue in 1862. Right. Blue 1862 was the year of the blue. But we're a long, 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 long way before we get to 1862 because we're only in July. And uh, that was the first Battle of Bow Run. We'll back for probably Battle of Masilla, Battle of Athens, Battle of Wilson's Creek. Maybe Charleston will get thrown in there if... Uh, it depends how long they are. So, yeah, we'll be back then to make sure you guys are going checking out. We got six episodes now, six. all of them leading up to uh, Bull Run. Bull Run. And especially if you're just tuning into this, I don't know why you'd be listening at the end without going back and uh, right. listening to the first part of the first Battle of Bull Run. But go listen to that one because yeah. you'll hear the, the uh, regiments and all that stuff, too. So, yep, that's us. We'll be back next week for a variety of battles. We are the Mouth of Michiganders with Bingo. Bingo.